This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plan, celebrating 76 years of providing Tennesseans with high quality health coverage at affordable prices. Visit FBHP.com to learn more about their history in Tennessee and to get a quote. That's FBHP.com. Welcome. I'm Mike Keith, joined by Titans Radio's Rhett Bryan and Coach Dave McGinnis. Welcome to the Bet MGM studio and welcome to the Snickers Hot Seats. Snickers hot seats. I am, you know, I, I always like being in the Snicker hot seats. First of all, because I like Snickers, and then there they are, right there. We have a whole thing of them. The whole thing. Red's a little closer to them than I am, which upsets me, but that's fine. All right, I want to review. You'll have your share. I want to review a couple things with you guys. The league just got together in Las Colinas, Texas. That's Dallas, basically, isn't it, Coach? Las Colinas is right outside of Dallas, really closer to Irving than it is to Dallas, but yes. So they just had – they have quarterly meetings. This one is a small one. The biggest one comes in March, and it's going to be, I think, in the Orlando area, but that's that's coming up next March. They do a few things at this. The NFL Accelerator Program goes on as part of this particular meeting where several – Uh, Minority candidates for bigger jobs in the league get a chance to go and introduce themselves to various ownership groups, other teams in different ways. They just get a chance to network. It's one of the ways that Rand Carthon came on the Titans' radar when they went to hire a general manager. Last December, he was part of the Accelerator program. You've been part of this league for nearly 40 years, Dave McGinnis. Why is it so important? Well, it's very important for the – in fact, you know, I was just visiting with Kevin who went – Kevin Turks from Kevin, the Titans. Kevin Turks. I just visited with him before we started this, you know, about it. It's important to get face-to-face. It used to be – when I was coming up in the league and all of a sudden became, you know, one of the hot young coordinators that may have had a chance, then they would they, they would send a film crew in and you would do an on-tape interview – on-camera interview, and then they would send it to the league, and the league would disperse it to all the teams. But that still is a little bit it, it artificial in the fact that you don't really get what we're doing right now, where we're face to face. You know, so I talked to Kevin about that, about how important that was. And then, you know, when I when I when I became a head coach, and 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 I, you know, would would send, you know, some of my young coaches and, and some of our the young scouts to those things. It's extremely important, just because this is a people business. As much of a high pressure business it is, and as as visible as it is, it's still a people business, and you have to be able to understand the person so it, it uh, talking with kevin today he was so grateful for this and it's a it's a it's a big thing it's an important thing that they're doing and it, and it it's productive also it's so much about fit any hire that you make if an owner hires a general manager or a head coach they've got to be able to have a relationship they've got to understand one another they, they've got to connect in some way, right? Well, absolutely, Mike. I mean, you know, I think we can all go through it in any of our careers with what's going on. I know it was important to me, you know, to be able to get in front of people and talk to people. And it may not have been right at the moment that something came from that, but you never know because the circle in this league is about this big. You know, let me ask you a question here on the, on the OTP and the snicker hot seat. If you hadn't have known me from the time I was coaching here, would you ever have called me to come back to do broadcasting well, of now? Of course not, because, well, I, because we knew you could do it. Well, but see, right. but, but you, we had to know each other as, as people first, and you had to see, you know, what, how they operate. And so this, this even though they don't, you know, they don't spend a, a whole lot of time together, the initial impression is important. So it, I think it's a great thing that the league does. Well, and that was one of the big emphasis of the meetings that, or emphases of the, the meetings that went on in Las Colinas. They also named the next Super Bowl that was not out there. This year, Las Vegas. Obviously, next year, Super Bowl 59 in February of 2025, Superdome, New Orleans. Super Bowl 60 in 2026 is San Francisco Stadium, which is Levi's Stadium in Santa Clara, California. And now Super Bowl 61 is back in SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles, just outside of Los Angeles. Are we going to play a Super Bowl, Rep. Bryant, every five years in SoFi? I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that. I think that is very well a thing. One, market. Two, building. Um, and I just think about, well, you just mentioned the Superdome hosting one in 2025. How many have been there? Right. So it's the same kind of thing, only it's in the big market. 
No, no, absolutely, we will. I mean, that's why that that's why that whole complex was built, and that was a, that was a huge thing. I was, you know, I was involved in that because I was involved with the Rams when we moved from St. Louis out there, and just to see everything that was surrounding that when that initially was going was going on, you knew something really big was going to come of it, and and since it's been on the ground, it, it has grown more and more and more. So the answer is yes. I think so too. A largely, I mean, it's a six billion dollar facility and complex, and you know this better than anyone. I don't know if the OT people completely realize the, the scope of the complex and the connectivity of that area for any kind of media, whether it be linear or digital or anything in between. Plus, you're in the entertainment capital of the world, and the Super Bowl is a much bigger event than a football game. Well, it absolutely is, and everything's surrounding. I can just speak from my personal experience as far as to us moving out there. I mean, we, we, we moved and lived for two weeks at L.A. Live, you know, before the draft, just to get all of, the, all of that, whatever it was, the atmosphere that, that came with that. It, it's, a, it's a different issue out there, and so I agree with you, Mike. It will be there. It, it's in the rotation. It will be interesting to see what Vegas is able to do with it because, uh, obviously, uh, Allegiant Stadium is supposed to be fantastic, but a lot of it comes down to the convenience for everybody in terms of running the event. That's why it goes back to New Orleans because it is a very convenient area to do everything. The hotels are right around there. There are places to practice, all sorts of things. You wonder how it's going to work for everybody in Vegas because it seems like the teams are going to have to be further out, potentially. And that's been a problem in some sites where, Red, it seems like, well, that's an obvious Super Bowl home, and yet they don't go back there on a regular basis because of the logistics of putting it together. Yeah, the footprint has to be idyllic. Right. And, and in some places it's not. And I know that some places get awarded because they're the new shiny stadium, whatever, or you know, they, there's a tremendous uh, bid process in trying to lure that event there. You know, That's why it makes sense with new Nissan Stadium. Ah, Talk about a footprint. Yeah. And you have the hotel room now. You have those. Um, it would make sense. And you know, the league knows this already because of the 2019 NFL draft. Here. Well, and they were in on pushing to get new Nissan Stadium done because they liked being here in 2019. They liked having another site where they knew the groundwork and how it all fit together. Keith Bullock on Titans Tonight this week predicted – that new Nissan Stadium would host Super Bowl 64, which would be in 2030. Uh, new, Nis new Nissan Stadium is the ideal spot. This will be, I mean, <clears throat> we, all know, we all know how Nashville puts on a show. But new Nissan Stadium, this will be an ideal spot. When it is here, people will love it, just like they loved when the draft was here, and things will start being compared to that. You you agreed with Keith. You think it may be I think 64. The time, I think the timing is right because it, one thing he mentioned on Titans tonight is the logistics and, you know, the, the scout team ahead of things because they'll want to come back to Nashville and look and see what the footprint has changed and in growth-wise and all that because it's been, you know, it will have been several years at that point on his, his guesstimation that the, the 2019 draft had happened. And so – with a major event, the event of the NFL, there'll be some careful vetting of and just checking everything out. So given that timeline, yes. The NFL also gives you a chance to get your place up and running first, you know, before they bring one sure. there. But, uh, you know, that, that will figure into the timeline too. Well, the first one they could host is 62. So the four that have been laid out, 58, 59, 60, and 61, are not ones – that factor into the to the current plan. So the first one they could host is 62. If Keith Bullock's prediction is right, we would have been playing football there for three years by the time it happened. You would figure that the, the new hotels and everything that are going to go on, the development around it, the Oracle development, all of those sorts of things would be in place. And I think the other question, too, that is going to come in, and it's going to be a discussion for Mayor O'Connell and, and council and everybody involved, is transit. You know, that's something that Los Angeles certainly has, all the major cities have, and, and that's something that you've got to deal with. The thing that you have, though, with this, having been to several Super Bowls, you know, just as a 
as a visitor or as a guest, you know, as a fan to, to go to, is that the international airport here, BNA, is close. Mm-hmm. It's close to downtown, and that's huge. And they've just done the massive improvement that they've done, which I think is nearing completion with the hotel. I mean, they've totally reshaped that facility to where, you know, everybody and their brother can get in and out of there now. If it's, you hadn't been to BNA, you won't recognize it. You won't recognize it. It's amazing. It. I mean, what their plan has worked, and it's continuing to work, and I know they, you know, I'm sure they have things they need to put into it, but I mean... If you travel around the country, if you travel internationally, it's a facility now that is comparable with the type of facilities that you need to make for for people to come in from around the country and around the world and to be able to get in and out. Yeah, and what we're saying is, regardless of the stadium, you needed to have all these other things in place structure-wise to be able to hold the event. I know the NFL has requirements about how many hotel rooms, all those things. Yes, but things have to fall into place like that. And you're right, the airport, Mac, that's a great point about what its capacity is, the proximity to downtown and all those things. And then the, the, that's one of the benefits of the growth explosion of the Mid-South and, and in Asheville in particular. The other thing, Mike, about this in red, and we're, we're talking about it, because it is a, it's a great point to bring up, the availability and the, and the, and the proximity that the press, because massive amounts of press, where they Crazy. can be, because that's one of the things that, that, that is a negative for some places is the press has to be so far away from where the actual event is. Here, you will not have to be. It, this is going to be an ideal setup. Well, and the other part of it, too, that continues to get asked by the fan base is, do you have enough capacity in the stadium? Do you meet the capacity requirement? And there is no capacity requirement anymore. There hasn't been for years. There was a feeling, because this was in place years ago, that you had to have 75,000 seats. You don't anymore. No. They're, they're looking for the venue itself, the quality of the venue, the quality of the infrastructure of the area. You mentioned the hotel. You mentioned transit. You mentioned airport. You mentioned all of these things that factor in where the teams can train. You know, because they've got to practice for a, a week. The media point is a great point. Where where do you put together all of those sorts of things? The aesthetics of the newer buildings, that's huge. It's a, it's a highly visible, televised event. And then the other thing, when you're talking about the, the rules about attendance and capacity, didn't that kind of just go to the the wayside when the television blackout rules were lifted? I think sort of that kind of was hand in hand. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. And then there were just some buildings they wanted to be in too. Mm-hmm. There were some places they wanted to go. Um, you know, there's some winks and nods at times about, hey, if you build this, you'll get a you know. And so I, I think some of that just sort of they they just let that fade away. It was not publicized. But it it faded away. Do we think that the NFL taking the NFL draft out of New York annually and starting to move it around helped in some – I think it helps Nashville in this case. Oh, there's no doubt. But I think that helped kind of accelerate having it in different spots more than just a handful of places. Even You know, we said so far we think it'll have a Super Bowl there every five years. And I think it will. Market and building. Sure. But um, I think that helps, doesn't it? It helps considerably. Because, the, I mean, let's face it, the NFL's in New York. And there are a lot of people in New York who think there's nothing outside of New York. <laughs> that's true. I, I mean, that's people always wonder, why do we see so much Giants and Jets? Because they're the New York teams. And they're, they're the big story in the Yankees and the, the Mets and the Knicks and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, it's... It to them is a is a big deal, and then when things happen outside of there, they're like, "Well, this is nice too." <laughs> <laughs> and well, that's what's outside the, of the city. <laughs> this is so great. I left the Holland Tunnel, and there's a whole other world. Well, I mean, it was. I, I said it, and listen, it was it was one of Phil Bredesen's big things about moving pro sports here. He wanted to get either Nashville or Tennessee on ESPN every night. Because he understood that that's what looks big time. And when people would come here, and this is, this is a slight exaggeration, but not terribly. When the network people would come here at first, in the late 90s, in the early 2000s, they would say, this place is really nice. Yes. And it was almost as if they were saying, you wear shoes. 
<laughs> it was a bless you, your heart moment. But it was a bless your heart moment. You have paved streets. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it, not every there's not a cornfield in every direction. No one rides horses downtown. <laughs> I mean, and, and that's what they thought. I mean, I, I read through what they were. I get it. But but you come to understand that when you deal with people in New York and now the the people with the league love to come to Nashville because they they dealt with cooperative people who know what they're doing. They saw how it was put on. They saw it was good for the league. They enjoyed it. Guess what? They've been to some of our restaurants. They've met our people. They've, I mean, they, they love to come here now from all over the country. And it, it's what we've seen with everything that has gone on with all the bachelorette parties and, you know, everybody that's moved here. We've, we've seen that. But the the NFL was kind of a, a first look inside that, almost inside the test tube and the national media coming here because they realize it's a great place. It's a destination city now. It is. Right. And and Phil Bredesen was a, a visionary in that way to see it that way because he knew if you got that television exposure, it, it's an infomercial for Nashville for hours and hours in sure. the state of Tennessee. So tourism and those things. And then you're right. That's 100% right, Mac, because Nashville is a destination city. When the when Nashville does get a Super Bowl, regardless of the two fan bases involved in that game, whoever that ends up being, it'll be a very popular destination to come to. It's like, oh, that just gives me a reason to go to Nashville. Well, because the weather will probably be okay. Yeah. I mean, historically, if you look at the, the first part of February, I mean, you could have really nice weather. Now, you can get snow, but the – you know, the, the hit right down the middle is generally low 50s, and so you could get outside with a coat. And, and it won't matter in the new Nissan Stadium. It won't matter stadium. in the stadium itself, but I'm saying for the week of, I mean, that's yeah. what really, mm-hmm. it really hurt Atlanta around Super Bowl 34 when they had the bad weather, you know, they had the ice storm, is that the media couldn't get different places, so they complained um, because it was hard. I mean, everybody knows nobody can drive in ice. And it was freezing cold and icy and difficult. And you hope you don't have that. But the, you know, the general middle of it is you could, you could get out and walk around Broadway with a decent coat um, and enjoy yourself in February. Sure you could. Oh, look at the weather we're about to have for the week of Christmas. It's going to be unseasonably warm. Yeah. So you could have that. I mean, you can get it. And, and so we'll see. But interesting, uh, interesting stuff to see it. I, I'm just so glad we're talking about this. Oh, absolutely. Which is, I'm excited about new Nissan Stadium, but I'm so fired up about discussing it. And by the way, if you're a Titan season ticket holder, new Nissan Stadium comes online in 2027. But if you're a Titan season ticket holder, remember, you have less than a week until December 18th. If you lock in your season tickets before December 18th, you will keep those prices as long as old Nissan Stadium or current Nissan Stadium, however we want to say it, is open. So call 615-565-4200, 615-565-4200, and you lock in your prices for your tickets at the current Nissan Stadium until it is done at the end of the 2026 season. That is a deal. So take advantage of it, 615-565-4200. Mike, you mentioned it right right there, too, and to put it in the proper context, new Nissan Stadium, you said, I'm glad we're finally talking about this and being able mm-hmm. to. That's the missing link. That was the that, – everything else in the city – Meets well, the requirements. Well, and then, we but be- that's the missing link. I think we become totally international at that point. Yeah. Because the Super Bowl is an international event. Yeah. We have an international airport. We do a lot of things with, you know, we have a lot of companies here now that this is their North American headquarters or this is their worldwide headquarters that they are international. But this shows it in that way. The way that other cities have become international over the years, I mean, it'll be a it'll be a big step. We will host different things here that are that are international. All right, so a couple more things out of the league meetings that we want to talk about. But first of all, I have to mention it's always game on with Duncan. So grab a coffee and kick off the action, whether that's drinking a cup of coffee on your way to the game or grabbing one to go before watching the game at home. Duncan is always there to help you get your game on. Just like the pros, we need to be at our best come game time, which is why 
Duncan is the most important part of your game day ritual because it's always the best call for football. America runs on Duncan. Duncan. All right, hip drop tackle. They are saying the hip drop the hip drop tackle must be taken out of the game. That's what the commissioner says. Now, for those who don't know, and I can say I didn't fully know, but I, I have a definition of hip drop tackle, Coach Mack. Tell me if you think this is right. In the hip drop tackle, the defensive player approaches from behind or the side, wraps his arms around the offensive player, and basically becomes dead weight while dropping to the ground. Often, the defensive player's body lands on the offensive player's legs. Is that a pretty decent description? You ever been to a rodeo? I, I've seen it. Our audience, anybody in our audience ever been to a rodeo? You know Many what, of you the know, OT people have been to a rodeo. Show. Okay, you know what bulldogging is? Where, you, where they let the steer out and you're riding along the steer and then, and then the cowboy comes off of the horse and grabs and pulls the steer down and then ties his legs okay, up. Okay, I know what that is, sure. That's a lot like it. That's a lot like it. And it, it's, it's absolutely, the description is absolutely what it is and most of it doesn't come from behind it comes from the side because you're chasing somebody horizontally and they're about to to break and get past you they're about to outrun the angle and so the only shot that you have at them is to is to try to bulldog them try to you know come from the side and then pull them down they've taken the horse collar out of it right. they're reaching to the back but it's just like coming off of that horse against that steer that's running right next to you that's getting ready to get past you all right so following up the definition why is it dangerous well but just because the dead weight drops on the back because all of a sudden the the runner the runner is is not only his forward momentum's not on, only stopped but he's bent backwards in other words he's bent backwards and the, and the levers in your knees and your ankles all of a sudden you're moving forward really fast fast and it comes to a sudden stop it comes just to a sudden stop and then the full weight of the tackler is on the back of your legs the way most offensive linemen get hurt is is everything that piles up in the middle something coming from behind that's what they're trying to take out okay one more question for you for from just a structural standpoint for a defensive player how much does it hurt their game if they cannot use this technique? Well, it, it, what they're going to have to be able to do is hit them. If you're coming from the side, hit them from the side and don't pull them down. Try to knock them sideways. you got to wrap up to be able from the side to knock them down rather than pulling them down behind. That's what's going to have to happen. So it's almost like we were taught years ago to run through. You're going to have to go back to running through the tackles. And you always should run through. The thing that happens is now, and and again, Mike, it's because the speed of the game has accelerated so much too. Because if if you're getting to the edge and you're getting an edge on a defender and and you're getting outrun to the to the. You're just trying to get the guy on the ground right now. You're not sure. trying to hurt anybody. You're trying to get them on the ground. And so this is something that you're going to have to learn to live with if they implement this rule, just like you had to learn to stay away from the horse collar, just like you, you, know, you, you had to learn to stay away from being able to cut people now, both offensively and defensively. It's just another thing that you're going to have to learn to do. Well, it, it, it's interesting. When Goodell comes out and says what he did, uh, about it, that we've got to get it out of the game. He works for the owners. And he's much like a politician in that he says certain things when he feels like he's got momentum to go a certain way. So when he lays that out, he must feel like there's momentum to take it out of the game. My guess, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that when they meet – in March, the owners meeting in March in Florida, the hip drop tackle, he's got 24 votes to get it out. Yeah, probably. Because, you know, Roger Goodell didn't invent it to talk about it. Right. Just to your point. Yeah, and he's got media people who are advising him, and I'm talking about his own media oh, sure. team. Oh, sure, sure. The, the other thing he said that was interesting uh, about the Kadarius Tony offsides in the Kansas City Buffalo game the other night. Um, he said he was incredibly proud of the officials and that why were we having this discussion? Because it was clearly the right call. That they made a call that Kadarius Tony was offsides on the play that ended up going for a touchdown because Travis Kelsey caught a pass, made a long run, lateraled back to Kadarius Tony. He went in for what would have been the go-ahead touchdown. 
It's called back because of offsides. Buffalo ends up winning the game. We saw Patrick Mahomes go crazy. Um, really went crazy for a day after the after the uh, the fact. I don't think anybody's disputing Rhett that it was the right call. Correct? No, uh, I mean, I mean, he was in the neutral zone. Yeah, we saw it. We were actually at dinner and saw it that night. But I think the point of contention is that it's ticky tack. That it's that it's you know it wasn't egregious, and it wasn't. I don't know. It, it, it just seemed like a call to be making a call. What do you think, Coach? He's off sides. He's he, off sides. He was off sides. He was off sides, and you, you don't you don't call for the circumstance of the game. You call for what happened. He but, was he was off sides. But to Rhett's point, the Kansas City Chiefs had not had an offensive player called for offsides in twenty eight years. Well, it should it should be twenty nine years now. He shouldn't have lined up off sides. And when you when you look at it, you know that that was a side judge call. The side okay. judge is looking right down the line, and he. he that side judge doesn't know they haven't had anybody call off sides in 28 years. I understand. He's looking at the moment, and at the moment the guy was off sides. Uh, it, this, this reminded me, I was reminded about what I said way back when in Arizona because the Arizona Republic sent me my quote when I had a player line up off sides in a ball game one time that was very consequential on what happened. And, you know, they asked me what I told the player, and I told the player, look, there are a lot of things about football that are hard. Lining up right isn't. Well, and Kadarius Tony points at the official, but he doesn't look at the official for what the reaction is. I think the official would have told him you need to step back had he looked at the official for – because what happens out there – and you They can, always do, Mike. You can explain it better than I do, but when I played wide receiver in high school, you would go out and you would line up, and if I was to be on the line of scrimmage, I would ask, am I okay – and they would tell you because they generally don't want to make that call. No. No, and, and you're, you're exactly right. And they will look over, and then the, the official is going to say, you're okay. You're okay. Or back up. He's not bound to that. He doesn't know. That's not a rule. <laughs> that is just – that's like some of the unspoken rules in baseball. Right. I mean, it, it really is. But, but you have to interact with them, and it's, it doesn't take very long to do that. But as you said, it, I mean, it didn't happen in that, in that instance. But I still go back to the fact that when you look at it down the line, you have to not be looking for it to see the resolve size. So you don't think, Dave McGinnis, that this is the equivalent – of Steph Curry in the final minutes of an exciting basketball game, driving the lane for the Golden State Warriors and laying the ball in the basket as all of the numbers on the clock go to zero and his team wins by one point and yet there was a whistle and he's called for palming the ball. Now, he may have palmed the ball, but do but, you call it? But to me, palming the ball, and again, I'm not, a, I'm not an NBA official. I got I, it. I've seen basketball before. But when have you seen palming the but, ball but called? Never. Okay, thank you. Never. But and it seen, is illegal. But you've seen, you've seen all sides called a lot. Uh, on offense? Yes. Coach. Absolutely. Coach. Yeah. And here's the other thing that you haven't, you haven't seen. How many times have you seen, have you seen an offensive lineman, especially a tackle in this day and age, not breaking the plane. Well, yeah, lined up at wing back. Well, so, and, and I mean, he, he they don't call that ever. Well, they do. I mean, so rarely. But they, they do call it. But they, they'll they come over to but, the sideline. All right, now I'm going to get head, you. Now come you're in to, my world. They'll okay. Come, they'll come over to a head coach. I've done it. And say, Mac, you need to move that tackle up. I've never done it, but I've been annoying on radio. So I'm going to do this <laughs> on the podcast. But, but that's an advantage. That's a that is a distinct advantage. It absolutely is that the, when the tackle lines up a half step behind, then he's got a better angle to do his kick start and get out and be able to block that edge guy. That's an advantage. Did Kadarius Tony have an advantage? No, he was offsides. Oh, coach, <laughs> <laughs> he was offsides. All right, Rhett, get in here. Where are you? Where are you? I know you're sitting in the Snickers hot seat right next to Dave McGinnis, but get in here. Come on. What do you got? Come on, Rhett. I don't know, man. Come on, Rhett. Know. You got to take a side. You have to right now. You always take a side, Rhett. And let me just yeah. ask you again. Without, don't look at Mike because – Don't I'm, look at Mac. I'm, okay. D I'm looking at the camera. Look at the camera. Look was, straight ahead. Was he offsides? 
Yes. End, end of story. Hey, rebuttal, redirect. <laughs> Do you call that in the fourth quarter of a big NFL game? And that's that's Do that's you the call problem. that? I'm not I'm not yeah. asking for a, a, a statement. I want an answer. Do you call that in the fourth quarter of a big NFL game of one of the top ten regular season games in the NFL? Knowing that this is one, this is one everybody who loves the NFL and people who don't are watching. Do you call that? No, thank you. Do you call that in the first quarter? I don't think you call it. I don't it think at all. y'all. I don't. I think you go over and you say Kadarius, and and th- and listen, Kadarius Tony is guilty. He's guilty for lining up proper, uh, lining up improperly. He's guilty for not asking. You know, they showed a clip of Tyree Kill from our Monday night game yes. ask, asking the official, absolutely, and then stepping back. I mean, but this is Kadarius Tony's career, which is why he's on another stop after being a first round pick. Because, you know, this is the little things. I get that. But do you not walk over to the sidelines if it's in the first quarter and go, hey, Coach, Coach Reed, um, your wide receiver, 19, is lining up in the neutral zone. We don't want to call that. Just tell him to step back or ask, please. And that's exactly why they look at him and say, up or back. How long has Kadarius Tony been in the league? Well, it doesn't make any difference. He's Kadarius Tony. That that doesn't. Make I know any it. I, I'm not defending. <laughs> if, I'm not if, defending. If Mike Keith is the receiver out there, do you line up on sides or off sides? Well, I I can't get into that because there are people who know the truth about how I used to line up. But <laughs> I'm also not getting paid millions of dollars, and I wasn't a first round pick for anything. But the even but more the point to the is, point. this is a business, and it's a it's a TV show. It is a, it's a great TV. Now, maybe you created great TV drama by calling this because Patrick Mahomes' whole thing afterwards. Wow. 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 I don't think I've ever seen him that hot. He was have beyond you seen, Have angry. you seen what he said today, Patrick Mahomes? He's apologized now. Yes. But, I mean, that, that didn't and, do any good. And, he and, still and, did it. Well, he did it. But Andy Reid walked back, too. Because in the, the emotion in the moment, That's believe right. me, I get that. But they both walked it back because really – Deep in their heart, just as you are deep in your heart, no, he's offsides. I know he was offsides. <laughs> I, I mean, he was offsides. We're sitting there at dinner, and I said they've called offsides. Of course, what we assumed was they'd called offsides on the defense, or that's what I assumed, because that yeah, lit- I- quite literally 99.9% of the time, that's because the offense doesn't ever get called for offsides. Illegal formation, illegal procedure, but not offsides. And that's why, because most of them know where to line up. Oh, coach. <laughs> and Rhett, you're no help. <laughs> no, I'm not. You're, re- you're, you're <laughs> truly no help. No, but you know who has a big help? Seat Geek, <laughs> the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. If you haven't heard the name yet, get used to it because you'll be here. Because you may- if you haven't heard it, is this your first time on the OTP? Well, welcome. Because I've been saying it all season. <laughs> Seat Geek. SeatGeek, the official ticketing partner of the Titans, whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or to any live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. So Titans fans can fan. Well, you can do that. <laughs> there we you go. won't step up for me, but you can do that. Oh, here we are. Yeah. Rich, you step if up I for If I wanted him. a guilt trip, I'd call my mom. Come <laughs> on, man. What are we doing? We're going to make you come out with more opinions. <laughs> All right, so you get this one. Oh, boy. Here we go. Do you like that the NFL is going to play a game in Sao Paulo, Brazil? I, I got to be honest. I don't know that I'm crazy about the expansion of going all over the place. I understand why. I understand, you know, against business. They're trying to make it an international sport, and it is growing in popularity in other countries. Um, I know that's a 10-hour flight. <laughs> I know that's a three, uh, there you know, three hours ahead an, of us. He still hasn't answered. Rhett? Yeah. Answer. Do you like that the NFL will play a game in Brazil? No. No. Okay. No, I don't. You want to ask me? Sure. I love it. I love it, too. I Why do you love not it. love it, really? Seriously. I love don't it. Don't you want to go to Brazil? I mean, yeah, that'll be fine. But it, <laughs> it, I mean, are it'll we be more exciting playing? than Jacksonville. Are we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, that's true. That's 100% true. And Jacksonville's fine, but I mean, I'm ex- I think it's great. I want to go to Germany. 
G- Germany? I, I would like to go to Germany. There has been nobody who has loved the London trips more than Rhett Bryan. That's true. Even though you ended up in Scotland. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 he, and, he and Philip Noel couldn't make a decision then. That's they true. decided to go to sleep on the train. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is that what happened again? Yeah, we fell asleep. Fell asleep on the train. Yeah, going back to the hotel mm-hmm. and woke up where? In Scotland. No, yeah. they weren't quite in Scotland. <laughs> we were quite a ways away from London. That's the truth. There you go. <laughs> we were out in the but you but you've loved it. I have. I mean, it's a completely new – because neither you nor I have been fabulous worldwide travelers in our lives. That's true. And so for us, um, there are members of my family who love to travel all over the world and have been all over and, – and, and I respect that. But it's kind of broken me down a little bit to say, okay, there are other places I want to go see now. You're saying I'm the New Yorker in this equation. We kind of are. <laughs> <laughs> we're the typical, we're the typical, what they call the typical Red, Americans, Red, I guess. Right? Back Arena, around Corinthians, up. here we come. Yeah. Well, it could be us. Because they're talking about Wouldn't it. Wouldn't that be wild? It would be wild. It'd be great. They play. They're gonna okay, play, you can talk me into we're gonna it. Play, okay. We're going to play eight games. They're going to have eight games internationally. I, th- I told Rhett, and again, I'm repeating Titans tonight, which you should be listening to every Wednesday because Keith Bullock's on it, mm-hmm. sponsored by Pinnacle Financial Partners, um, 6 o'clock Central Time on Titans Radio. It's a great show. Rich Eisen mentioned something to me, and I'm not meaning a name drop, but I was talking to him when we were in London, mm-hmm. and he said his theory is that we're going to end up with 17, 18 international games. And so then what you'll have is you'll have an international game in the 9.30 Eastern Time window every week. So then you'll have, for Eastern time, 9.30, 1, 4.05, 4.25, and then you'll have the 8.15 kickoff. I don't think that's out of the realm I of don't reality. Even, the more I think about it, and with them adding this, it makes so much sense because now you've got four Sunday packages to sell. So you have CBS and Fox in the afternoons. you got NBC at night. You you know you got Amazon on Thursday. Well, you got Amazon on Thursday, but you may be opening a window for Amazon or another streaming service to get in there because I mean we're going to go to more of that. Let's face it. Uh, certainly ABC and whatever incarnation they end up with, and we don't know what you know we don't know what uh, Disney's going to do with ESPN and and that part of their their property. But I mean everybody's looking for content, and the NFL is doing a fabulous job creating what is the very best content, and that is the games. That's 100% true. I mean, it is it is such the wave of the future. And I've been fortunate enough to be over there, been over there quite a few times with teams. I, I went over there in 1980. Did you do Japan too? No, I never did Japan. Never did Japan. But went to London in 1986, you know, to, to play a game before the, when they were just trying to play with it and start it out. And to see what it's done. I mean, I've done clinics for three years in a row in Germany going all over the, you know, the country of Germany, putting on American football clinics, you know, for BMW over there. It, it, there is so much out there, and all you have to do is go to one of these games yeah. internationally to see the response. And you're of, hooked. Of the, you're hooked. I'm hooked. I mean, I, I've had – I mean, if we could just win one of them. That's the only thing that's been yeah. missing so far. Maybe that's why I'm not that crazy about the <laughs> manifest Well, destiny. somebody's going to win. Somebody is. Somebody's going to win. All right, let me ask you this. All right. They said San San Paolo, Brazil in the meetings yesterday. Yes. What's the next destination after that if they do go to Rich Eisen's? Barcelona. Barcelona. Yeah. Now, Spain? uh, Yeah, I could be okay with that. Maybe they could do a couple places in Spain for sure. When and NFL then if it Europe, rains, we can see if the rain falls. Oh, wow. Oh, here we falls. go. Here we go. Here okay. we go. And when NFL Europe was running, Squirrel. Bar- Barcelona was one of the favorite mm-hmm. spots, you know, when, when NFL Europe was running, as were all of those places in Germany. i I give you another one. Australia. Good day. Good day. I mean, because they are, they are so into it. And, and climate-wise, when we're playing our football, they're in their spring and summer. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to worry about weather. They certainly have venues. I mean, it, you know. Here's another thing. When we went over there to London the one time to play, we signed a guy from London to be a kicker because it was a preseason game. Okay. So to get the people – you talk about Aussie. There's so many Aussie, foot, Aussie 
football kickers now in collegiate football oh. coming into this league. It, uh, I agree with you, Mike. That, that's the next venue, too. All right, final topic. Speaking of kicking, Troy Vincent says the kickoff is now, he, this is what he said at the league meetings, is a dead ceremonial play. Only 20% of kickoffs are returned now. So they have solved the problem of all the injuries on kickoffs. Injuries are way down on kickoffs because 80% of them are touchbacks or fair catches or, or not out of bounds. They're not returned. What's the answer, Dave McGinnis? Just keep doing it like you're doing it. You don't have to return them, but you've got the chance to return them if you want to. Now, everybody thought going into it that you were going to see a whole bunch of these pooch kicks, right. these pooch kicks, high kicks to make them, but they put the fair catch in there because they don't, and you're right, Mike, they don't want the collisions. They don't want the 40-yard, you know, brave heart running together down the hill. I think just leave it like it is. Leave it like it is. You've got it. You've made it safer. Now, if you want to return it, you can return it. But, Coach, it's not a play anymore. Leave it in. Oh. Doesn't take that long. Oh. I mean, you could – listen, you could spot the ball on the 25. You could have an opening kickoff to begin the game, and then you could spot the ball on the 25 every single time. You'd save time. You'd save in, in, injuries. You'd be able to, you know, have some regulation in the game. It would change how you would make up your roster potentially. It would be a huge change at, at the way you mm -hmm. make up your roster. It would make, it would make a huge change there. It would, it would take – and th that point, the people probably don't think about. You think about everything. Well, now you do. Nah. You do because it, 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 would, it would take some positions away because some guy back in the day, some guys were hired just to do that. Right. And, that will, and, and that's lessening. And so you've got a point there. Well, would you, I guess my question would be, would you rather see six to eight more snaps from center? The answer to that is yes. Yeah. Because I, that's why I'm against the tush push thing. Because I don't think that's a football play. I think that's a rugby play. I want to see football snaps when I watch football. And the kickoff is is no longer that. When they return the kickoff, it's great. I understand the injury thing. Anybody who's ever covered a kickoff or returned a kickoff understands it's a lot more dangerous than a punt. Well, in, in terms of safety, what you're describing is the, the current kickoff situation. It's uneventful, which is what you want. But it doesn't move the needle if it's uneventful. Yeah, but do we want uneventful in a game that we're no, trying to sell to the world? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. In the player safety side, that's what you want. In the entertainment side, no. All right, so everybody talks about the XFL rule on kickoffs. And here, here's the rule. Kicker is at the 30-yard line. He kicks off from the 30. He must kick the ball in the air. And it must be in play. No such thing as a touchback. It must be in play from the end zone to the 20. 20. So he's got to drop it in there somewhere. So he can't do the missile kick or the fair, you know, he can't do that. He's got to, he's got to kick off. The coverage team lines up on the return side's 35-yard line. The return team lines up on the 30-yard line. So they're not that far apart. So they will have contact, and it would take a certain kind of returner to be good at it. It's, it looks like a football play. What do you say to this, Coach Mack? If, if you put the fair catch in there, I, I'm, I'm for it. Why do you want the fair catch? Well, because if you don't want to return it, if you don't want to return it, and they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna pooch it, all right, you want to take, you want to take the contact out of it. Even if – and you watch the USFL yeah, games. Yeah, I do. There's contact on those. On, sure. There's contact. So if you're trying to take the contact out of it, you want to lessen it, but give yourself a chance to avoid all the contact by the, having the fair catch rule in. But I don't know that I want no contact. I, th I think I want contact on that play. They don't want it for the safety. That's why they're doing it. Okay. Rhett, what do you think of that? I love the implementation of that. But I will say this. If, if – the safety is the most important thing, like he's talking about. I don't know that you'll have it. You just take it out altogether? Yeah. So do you do the fourth and 15 play as opposed to the onside kick then? Yeah, the, on, the onside kick, you know what? I like that innovation, the, the, the fourth and 15. I do because, too. Because the onside kick thing is done. 
Yeah. It's, it used to be an art to it. Sure. There used to be an art to it, and you could scheme it because you could overload it, and there used to be an art to being able to be the guys on the front line that were going to take the front of the cavalry charge when it was coming at you right. to the ones back behind. There's none of that anymore. It's You talk about something that's uneventful. The 4th and 15 would be eventful. I agree. I, I, I know people think when we talk about this thing, we're talking about gimmicky, and I get that. But I think the world changes, and the game has evolved since 1869 as well. I mean, there are different things that have gone on at different points. I think if there are ways to keep it being football and make it safer, I, I, I think that only makes sense. No, I, I, Maybe I, I'm naive. I no, 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 no. I agree with that. And, and I agree with that part of it. And I also agree with the part of if, you, if you're ever in a point of a ball game, which we've all been in. Sure. You know, we've all been in a point of where you're, you want to catch up and you got to get the ball back. At least if you take that shot on fourth and 15, you got a chance. With all of these implementations, let me just get back to saying this. you got to line up off sides. Oh, well. <laughs> it all comes now back. Now he's doing this. He wasn't saying that the other night in the restaurant. You got to line up on sides. It was after the people got him from Arizona. They turned him around. No, I looked at it and I said he's off sides. Oh, I, I mean, I know he was off sides. <laughs> but, Mike, uh, I, I don't want to thank you for the dinner. It was great dinner. It was great dinner. It, was great <laughs> dinner. it, really, it really was <laughs> and, so and, good. And you paid for thank it. So, so, thank it you for, so, so thank you for so that. So fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> this is my this is my life. I thought you had my back. I really did. Oh my, come on. <laughs> Again. You want me to call my mom? <laughs> we'll get a Snickers. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. Let's do this again. This was fun. We should. Yes, we will do this. Uh, how about next Thursday? It's great. It's okay. Day, next Thursday. Okay. For Rhett Bryant and Coach Mack, I'm Mike Keith. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for the OTP. Right